past the halfway point. And uh, we are looking at the book of Jonah this morning, the book of Jonah, which we are quite familiar with. And we'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. Let's read responsively from the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Uh, Responsively, this is the word of God. Verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Therefore now, O God, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than for, for, for me. Uh, I'm sorry, take, uh, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah went out of the city and sat in the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Let's read together. And should I not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Amen. That's the word of God. Um, I'm sorry, my Bible is so tiny. I, maybe my, the Bible is getting tinier every week. Is it my eyes or my Bible? I, I think I, maybe I'm getting old. Sorry. <laughs> Try to get a better, bigger Bible next time. As we observe our society, we see us so divided. We couldn't be more divided, right, on almost everything. Imagine or think about the blogs that you regularly visit, the sites, internet sites, or uh, a, a news uh, app that you regularly look at. And think about the replies, the comments. And people are divided so, so uh, heatedly over these issues. They're so different. You're either on this side or that side. And uh, we um, tend to think of the other side that does not agree with us as an enemy. <laughs> We, are, we have these heated conversation online, all the comments and replies. You think about, I don't like to talk about politics too much from the pulpit, but just to mention, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats, you know, they differ on every, it's amazing how it could differ on so many things. There are little common ground between the two parties. Same way in Korea, there's the conservative side and there is the more liberal side. And there, it, the difference is night and day on every single issue. When we find people uh, who are against us, I think the response is usually one of, one of the two. Either you uh, heatedly defend your, your view, that you are correct, that you are right, or you ignore the other person, saying, thinking that, it's, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth the trouble to even explaining your situation. We have this uh, mind of defending our views or, or ignoring them. And maybe in your mind, in your unconscious mind, you consider them as an enemy in a world that is so divided these days. But that presents a problem for us, for us Christians. Because what does the Bible say about our enemies. Jesus said, you know, love your 
enemies. And that is a, a very difficult command for us. It becomes a problem for us. Because you know that command, love your enemies, is of Jesus. That is a trademark command of Jesus. It's not something that he said in random and in just passing. He emphasized it throughout his life. He says, it's a new command I give you. And so if you, even if you're not, not a Christian, even if you don't really love God, everybody, many people know that Jesus is known for love your enemies. How do we respond to our enemies, though, in real life? We know in our head that, yeah, that's what God told us and that's what we ought to do. But what is our response when we are confronted with somebody that we are not comfortable with? And we know they are, in fact, against our views, against what we believe. What is our response? Maybe uh, you try your best to you know, give a, a light smile uh, before their presence, and you quickly ignore them or try to avoid an uh, uh, encounter altogether. But as disciples of Jesus Christ, as people who have received this almost impossible command to obey, how shall we respond? Even if we cannot go as far as loving our enemies, can we have a concern for those that are not particularly of interest to us? And why should we really care for, about them? Once we are understand, once, unless we are firmly planted in why God wants us to love our enemies, why God cares for those that we don't really care about, unless we are firmly planted in that heart of God, there's no way that you and I can actually obey this command of Jesus Christ. My message this morning, the question I'd like to raise is, how can we love them? Them meaning they could be the neighbors you don't really think about much, them meaning a particular person in your life that is um, you know, a pain in the back. It could be somebody that is always against you, maybe even harmed you. How can we, how could we love them? We look at the story of Jonah as we are looking into the Prophet and King series. Last week we looked at Prophet Hosea, and Jonah was another prophet in the same, he was a contemporary of Hosea. Because he lived in the 8th century before Christ in the northern kingdom uh, when Jeroboam II was king. And uh, we saw how God was pursuing the people of Israel as we heard um, Hosea's message, how he had to marry an adulterous wife. And uh, it was a picture of how God pursued us. Even though we, make, we do adultery, we commit adultery with the idols of our culture in our days. Well, at the same time, the same, another prophet by the name of Jonah, he was a prophet to the nation of northern Israel in the 8th century, mid-8th century, uh, 8 BC. And uh, he is no, no stranger to the people of Israel because uh, in 2 Kings, we find that he had already preached a message from, of God. 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 25, he prayed and he blessed the people of Israel because God sent Jonah to bless them. In a harsh, economic, uh, difficult situation, God comforted them through the prophet Jonah. But today, in the book of Jonah, we find a very different assignment for Jonah. And we know this story very well. But I'd like to highlight a, a very important aspect from this book that we, it is so easy to, to neglect. God was concerned. Concerned is very understatement, right? He was uh, about to punish, judge, and destroy the city of Nineveh. And Jonah was sent to no other, no other place but to Assyria, the cap, to, to, uh, to Nineveh, the capital city, city of, of Assyria. And he was to go to the people and warn them against the social violence that, they, that, was, that was so prevalent in the land. He was to warn them against the idolatry that these people had fallen into. And the evil had come up to the Lord. Evil of the city had filled up. And they were on the verge, on the brink of being destroyed. But the problem was that uh, Jonah didn't agree with God. He didn't want to go to the enemy country of Assyria. God said, go, and Jonah said, no. So he goes the totally opposite direction. You know this very well from the Sunday school stories, right? 
the picture, please. And uh, we see that Jonah, he got in the boat to Tarshish. Where is Tarshish? Tarshish is uh, a city or town way where Spain is, right? Uh, and uh, you, it's the farthest you can go from the opposite, most opposite direction from where Jonah, God told Jonah to go. Nineveh was 550 miles, 550 miles to the northeast. Uh, the other city was 2,500 miles by sea. And so he goes down to the harbor uh, and of Joppa and he takes the ship to Tarshish. And as we know, um, God was uh, God intervened. Why did Jonah react so uh, sensitively to God's command? Uh, after all, Jonah belonged to God. He was a prophet of God. He was supposed to listen to God. But how dare did he? How dare he go against him? Because you got to understand, it wasn't just logic that you know he didn't uh, didn't want to go to enemy territory. It was more emotional. And when we are emotional, we make the most illogical, you know, most uh, dumbest decisions. And this is what Jonah did. Even the man of God made the, this weird, stu uh, stupid decision, actually. Because uh, over the years, uh, the kingdom of Assyria had assaulted Israel, the border, and it had persecuted the people along the border. And you got to understand, about 60 or 70 years ago before Jonah, uh, the king of Assyria had attacked a northern kingdom, and uh, actually uh, received the submission of the king Jehu. Uh, there is a picture on there as well, on that. Um, look at the picture, take a look. This is the actual um, obelisk that uh, archaeologists found in the um, uh, 19th century AD. And uh, this is one of the few uh, very rare examples of how the Bible is crossed Examine it's cross proven from archaeology, and we find the name Jehu, the king of northern Israel, and he's bowing down to Salmoneser, the king of Assyria. This uh, was an insult, right? Your king, your government leader, is bowing down, head down to the earth, bowing down to this king, and now you have to pay tribute. So Israel is paying tributes. All these years to Assyria. And so for God to tell him to go to Assyria was insulting. To speak the gospel to Assyria, to Nineveh, was uh, he, something that he didn't want to do more than death itself. He didn't, he'd rather die, right? Imagine, it's like this, maybe your you know, father or grandfather was a you know, veteran and he, he died in the Korean War, maybe. Um, just imagine. And God tells you to go to the capital city of Pyongyang today and, uh, you know, do good works. To, you know, send stuff there and to care for them. I'm not sure if I would be able to do that. And that's what, how it felt for, for Jonah. He had this strong resistance against the word, the command of God. But did Jonah have a choice? He didn't have a choice, but he made his choice, a third choice anyway. And uh, we know that he ends up in the bottom of the ocean. He disobeys. God brings this tremendous storm, this amazing storm and that nobody can overcome. And the sailors had to throw him overboard because he was the cause of what they found out. And uh, when he was about to drown deep in the Mediterranean Sea, God had prepared this big fish to swallow him. Jonah spends three days and nights in the belly of the fish. And uh, amazingly enough, he has a time to reflect in this belly of the fish. And he realizes that he's alive. Wow, I am still alive. Like a submarine, I am alive in the depths of the ocean. I thought I was dead. I thought I fainted, but I am still breathing. And he starts, he starts to realize this is the grace of God, that God had pursued him all the way down to the depths of the ocean, to the depths of Sheol, the Bible says. And there he finds salvation. He finds that God is still good. God is a God of second chances. And at the end of chapter 2, he prays, praises God, and he prayed to God this one sentence. Of, of his confession of faith. And after he had prayed, and after he has praised God from the belly of the fish with his last sentence, as if it were a, uh, a magic command, you know, the fish 
spat him out, you know, vomit him out on the shore of the uh, northern Israel coast. In chapter 2, verse 9, it says, What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This statement was a statement that came out from his deepest being. Jonah, this was real to him that now I can obey you, Father God, because I know there is no other hope, but only you are the hope. You are the salvation that saves me from any and every situation. There's how, where, would I, where would I be unless, uh, how could I live unless you have grace on me? You bless me. So he was able to uh, be saved through this amazing experience. But the question for us is this. So did Jonah now, he learned his lesson. Would he gladly and joyfully obey the first original command of God? Chapter 3 to 4 tells us that, chapter 3 in fact, the first part of chapter 3 tells us that God commands Jonah a second time. Go, Jonah. Go, rise up and go to the city of Nineveh. And this time, he immediately goes up and preaches. Uh, interesting description of the city is here. They say that Nineveh, it took uh, a person three days to actually explore the city. It was a big city, huge, huge city. I remember uh, when I was a little bit younger, I traveled to Paris. I did, uh, you know, the, the trip the guys do, you know, on their own. And uh, there was a time I was able to walk across Paris, not walk across, but I, I ended up walking like two hours uh, in the middle of the night for, I'm not going to tell you why, but I was walking in Paris. I realized after two hours that I had walked halfway into the city of Paris. And then I realized if I just walked two more hours, four hours in total, I would have, you know, the, uh, walked across the entire city. Uh, it was not that big, but so many people were living there. But imagine, Nineveh, a three-day walk into the city. It's such a big city, not only in terms of size, but the number of people living in this uh, near ancient East, uh, uh, ancient near, near East society. This was an amazing capital city. And he was to go into the city and, and preach. And he did. For uh, one day. He did ministry just for one day. He says, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. This was the gist of the message. Imagine, picture jo uh, Jonah stand, standing on a street corner, maybe like here at our street corner, middle field and East Meadow, and uh, just as a street preacher preaching out that your sins have been, have been uh, noticed by God and you will be destroyed in 40 days. And he wanted them to be destroyed, in fact. But amazingly enough, um, the people probably had this in their consciousness. They, they had guilt already. And when they heard a prophet, a foreign guy, a foreign prophet judging and saying this judgment and coming in the name of God, it reminded them of the corruption in their society. It reminded them of the violence that is prevalent in the society. It reminded them of how the strong is always abusing the weak. And they felt guilty. And one by one, every person started to put on sackcloth and put on ashes and repented, prayed, cried out for mercy. And this news got to the king and he decreased the whole land that now everyone should wear sackcloth, everyone put, should put ashes, even the animals. Let's all repent. Let's all cry out to God and maybe he will have mercy upon us. Jonah sees this and he is just in awe. He's amazed. He's not used to this kind of uh, reaction. Because why? When he was back in Israel, when he would preach, people would make fun of him. They were cold, stone-hearted, and he would get a negative response. But wow, these people, wow, there, there was a revival. There was a, a call to pray. There was a call to repentance. If you were Jonah, what, uh, how would you feel at this time? Would you be happy about it? because they're responding to your message? Or would, would you be upset about it because you didn't want them to repent? It was a mixed feeling. But Jonah, we find his heart was, he came down, down to one emotion, and it was rage. He was angry. He was not just angry at the people, but he was angry at God. Right? He was angry because God was going to forgive them 
those people who have wronged him and his people, Jonah's people. He knew that God is a God, good God and gracious God, compassionate God who always uh, forgives when we repent. And that, was, that forgiveness was supposed to be reserved for his people only. But not the Ninevites, not the Assyrians. But now God was forgiving them and he changed his mind. The judgment, the promised judgment would not come. And therefore Jonah was enraged. I, I see Jonah's heart like this. Uh, you know, an aquarium, you know, a, a fish tank in your home. You've had one of those before, right? Or maybe you do have one. We had one last year, but we, we said never to suffer the fish again <laughs> after all of them died uh, a couple of months. I don't know how some of you do it. Right? <laughs> Imagine, you know, it's a clear, you know, a clean aquarium. There's fish swimming there. You, it looks clean. But when you put your hand in the, the sand or the pebbles and you stir up, the, 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 all the uh, you know, sediments come up from the bottom and it murks up the, the water. It's no longer clean. It's, it's filthy, right? Maybe that's how, it was, how Jonah's heart was. He gathered up the strength. But, uh, 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 he got the strength to, to obey God and he, with the conscience of the prophet, he preached the message. But when, he, when something stirred his heart, when he saw the people repenting, it, uh, something came up from the bottom of his heart, and it was rage. It was anger. This is not the response that's supposed to happen. And so this rage comes from the heart, and it comes out through his mouth. What does he say? The verses we read this morning, in fact, is what he said. Chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 says, Oh Lord, I'm going to, you know... Um, Cut a little bit. Oh Lord, I knew that you are a gracious God and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, oh Lord, please just take my life. Kill me now. Is this something a man of God should say who has been saved from the very depths of the ocean? His life was spared. God valued his life. And now he's saying, God, just, just end it here. I don't want to be part of it. I don't even see what's going to happen. And he was so enraged he did not know what to do. The question for us is this. What would happen to Jonah? You know, we know that Nineveh would be saved and spared. Now people repented. But what would God do with Jonah? Would God just say, you know, deal with it. Bite the bullet. I don't care. You know, it's your problem. I was here for, I sent a messenger to Nineveh. And sorry, if you feel that way, that's up to you. How would God respond to Jonah? In fact, the last part, this chapter 4, tells us that God gave one more chance. God who is gracious, long-suffering, who is persevering, gives even Jonah another chance in order to give him the most important lesson. Maybe the theme of the entire book of this, of this uh, book of Jonah. God reveals his compassionate heart toward Nineveh to Jonah. You know, we see that Jonah is on the east side of the city. Now he has pitched a tent. I see a canopy outside. You know, guys pitch a tent and doing Bible study outside. Is that legal? <laughs> it looks cool. <laughs> maybe I'll join you guys. Jonah pitched a tent in the scorching sun to maybe as a spectator. He had this heart. Maybe... You know, God, again, will change his mind, and he will fire, you know, sulfur and brimstone, like he did to Sodom and Gomorrah, and that city, evil city, would be totally destroyed. So he was a spectator. I'm going to see, watch what's going to happen. I'm going to put a shade over my head. And what does God do? He sends, he grows up this, this plant, uh, a leafy plant, it says. And suddenly it becomes a shade. It's cool, and he likes it. It's comfortable, right? You've had the experience, right, in the California summer, when over the sun and uh, you're stopped at the traffic light and you happen to be stopped under a shade you know I feel good and I feel some cars kind of you know they don't scoot all the way up they stay behind to be in the shade so selfish <laughs> anyway it feels good to be in the shade and Jonah enjoyed it this is wonderful but the next day before dawn God attacks it with a warm it says and he blows the east wind upon the plant. All withers and goes away. And now Jonah is saying the same thing he said before to God. God, just kill me. It's scorching. I'm so dizzy. 
and it's not worth it. God, just kill me. And God's purpose, God's lesson was this. At the very end, the last two verses that we read. Can we go back to those two verses? Brother Faisal, 10 and, 10 and 11. Okay. I'll read 10 and you read 11. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, or, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. The key word is pity. Should I not care for it? Should I not love for these people, 120,000 of them to be exact? Uh, you care for this plant? Should I not care concern for these people? What is the reason that we Christians can love them, our neighbors, and even our enemies? There are two lessons that we need to take out, take away from this book of Jonah. The first is that we can love them for God so saved us. Because God saved us, we can love them. It means that our cups, our, our, our spiritual cups are all filled. We have experienced the salvation of the Lord and we are ready, we are equipped to love those he sends us to. What is true salvation? True salvation is seeing your life being shaped by God, your life being changed to be more like our son, the Son Jesus Christ. Uh, I've been reading The Purpose Driven Life with some of our brothers um, last week, and uh, the pastor makes an a, a, a important point that uh, when we are in difficulties, when we are suffering, we want to pray this. We want to say, Lord, Comfort me. Maybe that was Jonah's prayer when he was on the boat of a rebellion. He could have said, comfort me. God, make this stone go away. God, I don't want to be in this spot. Comfort me. But what is true salvation? Is true salvation just getting rid of all the difficulties in our lives? Pastor Warren says, no. We should pray, conform me. Not comfort me, but conform me to the Son of Jesus Christ. Jonah was to pray, conform me to your plans. And this was truly salvation for Jonah. He realized that God is, I am wrong and God, you are always right. Salvation comes only from you and I will adjust my will to yours. Now I will comply because you are the source of salvation. There's, where should I run? To. Where should I run away to? Salvation is realizing that you are not the source. You are not the, uh, the, the so solution. You don't have the solution, but I'm like that God is only the solution. And if God puts you in a place where you have to change your ways because he loves you, because he disciplines you, that is salvation. As we've experienced this salvation in our lives, and we look at back at our lives how how much mature we are from where we've been. Now we are able to endure suffering and persecution sometimes because trusting our Lord that He is good and He will have His ways. I've, uh, I think I've uh, shared this illustration with you before, but my daughter, you know, goes to the doctor and this is when she was little. Now she's really big. Not that cute anymore. But when she was cute and cuddly, and <laughs> don't say this to me. <laughs> Anyway, you know, we go to the doctor to get a flu shot. You should get a flu shot, by the way. And, uh, you know, it's a big needle to her. Which is not that big, but big to her. It's, you know, like a stabbing knife to her. And uh, what does she do? She said, Daddy, it hurts. Why do you put me through this torture? And uh, she ran away. You know, she holds tightly and, and more fast to Daddy and say, Daddy, it hurts, but still trusting Daddy. When, what is salvation? Salvation is, is cure from the disease, from the virus that can attack us. Salvation is conforming to more like Jesus Christ from our sinful nature. And because we have experienced this, we are ready to bless somebody with this tremendous grace that we have. God readies us for God's work by filling us with his salvation 
love. That's the first reason that we can, we can love the enemy. And second, how can we love those that we cannot really love? Second is that for God so loves the world. It's simple. It's because God loves them and we love God, so we therefore love those whom God loves. The reason that we can even extend our love to the, our enemies is because God is gracious and merciful to those, even those who we don't like. Just, be, just, just, like, uh, just as we rejoice in our salvation, just like Jonah rejoiced in his salvation and he was ready to go to Nineveh, we must realize that our enemy need the same joy in their lives. They need the same salvation that we have experienced in our lives. And in fact, God wanted to show us that, that He cares for them. That they are also in need of salvation. To summarize, God wanted to show His own heart to Jonah for that He had for Nineveh. The heart of God was the heart of compassion. I want us to think about that word compassion a little bit this morning. Compassion. God was looking at the city of Nineveh and he saw this whole 120,000 people running straight toward, they were running as fast as they can toward this cliff. They were running toward destruction, devastation. There was no salvation for them. And God sees his creation, his people, his dear people, and he has pity on, on them. He is concerned for them. And God wanted to show that heart to, to uh, Jonah. The word compassion in English you know, is a com compound word, right? Compassion. Passion is passion, your emotion. And come means together. So God wanted no, Jonah to have compassion with God. Compassion that he has for the people. God wanted Jonah to experience that compassion. Um, you can show the word actually on there. Um, and this word in Hebrew, I'm, I'm sorry, Greek, uh, is on the, on the screen for you. Can you actually read that? Even in the English, you know, uh, can you even try? <laughs> yes, uh, splank, not, splank nizomai, that's how I pronounce it. Splank nizomai, you know, splankna is the intestines. It means that your intestines are moving, your vows are uncomfortable. It's very personal to you. Compassion means that you feel the pain. Somebody else is hurting, but you look at the situation and you realize that I've been there too. And my inward intestines are moving and it's uncomfortable, it's hurting because that person in a, is in a very difficult position. In fact, Jesus used, uses this expression. The, the old gospel uses this much. In Matthew chapter, ver, chapter 9, verse 35, 36. Let me read verse uh, 35 and maybe can you read verse 6. Uh, let's read like that. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. To Jesus, they weren't just globs of people. They weren't just sick people in line to be healed by Jesus. They were like sheep. They were blind. They were weak. They didn't know where the green grass was. The leaders, the, Israel, the uh, you know, Jewish leaders didn't care. They were shepherdless, leaderless. And they were hurting themselves. And the word splankna, Jesus moved inside. It disturbed him. It was hurting him to see his sheep suffering because of Satan, because of the spiritual blindness. The question that you and I want to ask and answer this morning is this. It comes down to this. Do you have the splankna of Jesus Christ? Do you have the heart? Do you have the mind of Jesus Christ? Do you have the compassion of Christ? The only way we could love an enemy, love those who have hurt us, love those who are, we are normally indifferent to, the only way we could do that is when we see them with the heart and feel them with the heart of Christ. 
We must see their spiritual state of how they are changed, enchained, slaved to sin. They're looking for a way out. They're looking for the truth. They're looking for eternal life. Maybe they're not saying that I need Jesus. They'll, ne- they'll not say, say that to you. But we need to read what they're feeling, what they're saying to us spiritually. And God saw, sees them. God saw the Ninevites. God sees our culture and generation. Brothers and sisters, let us pray for the mind of Christ. The only way we could love our enemy, love those that hurt us, is when we have the mind of Christ. Many of you probably read the news uh, or saw the news, watched the news, whatever, of uh, the uh, um, 39 people who were trapped in the container in England and uh, lost their lives. As you read the news, what came to your mind? Oh, there are so many you know, atrocities, catastrophes like this in the news, so maybe you might say, oh, it's just another one of those incidents. I feel sorry for them, I feel bad, but maybe it was just one of those news. But when we uh, uh, realized that there were 39 uh, people trying to immigrate, trying to have a better life, can we, can't we identify with some of their, their motivation? Of course, you and I didn't come in containers or illegally, but the heart is the same. We wanted, they wanted a better opportunity for their kids, more freedom. They wanted a, a better chance for their lives to pursue happiness, to pursue opportunities. And uh, when we realized that they're immigrants, our hearts are hurt because uh, they died. And uh, when we see their faces, it becomes more personal. It's not just 39 people, but it was a Vietnamese girl, you know, who texted last moment to her brother and saying, I cannot breathe. I love you, mom. Bye. And a brother who's saddened by these things. When it becomes first person, we can uh, feel their emotion. We have a brother, we have a sister, we have been immigrants, we are immigrants, and we feel their pain. We can have what's called compassion. Our insides are uncomfortable. We want to do something for them. And that, I believe that is the heart of Christ. But beyond news and what's, whatever happening in the world, we also as Christians need to see spiritually. As I mentioned before, there are so many people who are entrapped by sin. They are not in a physical container, but spiritual container. They're looking for a way out. There are people around you even. If you have a mind, if you have an eye to see that people, you know, cutting, slitting themselves because they see no meaning of life. They, they want to know what their purpose is. They want to have a meaning for their life. A Lord, in fact, a shepherd in their life. And should we not, shall we, should we not have compassion for those? Because we've been there before. And that is the message of the book of Jonah. That uh, we can love those that we don't like. Because God has tremendous compassion for them. So our prayer, our heart's desire this morning should be, God, plant in me, God, replant in me the heart, the splankna of Jesus Christ to truly be able to love those you have sent me to love. To even be good to those who are considered my enemies. Maybe I categorize them as enemies because they have done something wrong to us. But as we, as we a people of God who receive the salvation of God, let us pray for the mind of Christ so that we can love those that God sends us to love, even the Ninevites. Let's pray this time.